and it's the midweek edition of Business Morning on Channels Television. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning live on Channels Television. I'm Laddie Williams. Great to have you join us. Let's uh, take a look at some news. World Trade Organization has lowered its forecast for global trade growth this year uh, from 4.7 to 3 percent, largely due to the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war. At the same time, the WTO warned that uh, lockdowns in China to prevent the spread of COVID-19 are disrupting a seaborne trade, which could lead to a renewed shortages of manufacturing inputs and high inflation. Speaking at a press conference, the Director General of the 164 country member intergovernmental body, Gozi Okonjo Wella, raised concerns over the, doubly, the double whammy impact of global economy in the long term. Do take a listen. The economic reverberations of this conflict will extend far beyond Ukraine's borders. It's now clear that the double whammy of the pandemic and the war has disrupted supply chains, increased inflationary pressures, and lowered expectations for output and trade growth. We would now expect, expect world merchandise trade volumes to grow by about 3% in 2022. This is 1.7 percentage points down from the 4.7 percent growth we forecast last October. Trade growth in 2023 is estimated at 3.4 percent. The forecast projects global GDP growth at market, market exchange rates. That global GDP at market exchange rates will grow by 2.8% in 2022, down from the 4.1 projected prior to the war. And the Nasara state government says the state is reaping the benefits of its economic and development strategy, which has resulted in boosting their internally uh, generated revenue by 20% in the past two years. This according to Governor Abdullahi Sule while speaking to journalists ahead of the state's investment summit coming up next month. We came in in 2019. By 2020, our revenue had actually grown roughly 20% of our IGR. And when we came in, our IGR was roughly about seven to eight billion. By 2021, right now, the latest figure we have is roughly 16 billion. So a lot is going on in order to improve what is happening uh, in the state. So we came up with this document, which will be driven for 2019 to 2023, which led us actually into coming up with uh, the highly respected uh, advisory council and we are already beginning to see the implementation of these net documents we call it uh, NEDS you know Nasra economic development strategy all right now to our first conversation financial inclusion has been described as a tool for driving uh, e inclusive economic growth reducing inequality eliminating uh, systemic poverty and improving communal welfare uh, studies have shown a strong correlation exists between financial inclusion and economic development. Well, fintechs are playing a role with financial inclusion in Nigeria, as over 200 fintechs uh, currently operate in Nigeria. Well, let's uh, get some insights and developments uh, in the fintech space. We have Chizo Malize, Managing Director of Financial Institution Training Center, FITC, joining us uh, right here. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very glad to be here again. Uh, great, great to have you. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, financial inclusion, you know, in Nigeria, getting the unbanked, uh, banked and, you know, all of that. But I'm wondering, how is tech and innovation changing, you know, our world at this time? Technology has totally changed the way that we live lives, from transportation to communication to socialization, entertainment, even healthcare and education. And we've also seen the way that COVID-19 has totally made everyone understand that technology is a huge enabler. We can live around technology and have better and easy life. So technology has extended to the way that organizations are even interacting with their people and the way that organizations design products because the designs of those products and the engagement of their consumers and markets are primarily driven by technology today. So technology has totally changed the way that even medicine and med medical experts operate because you can begin to see telemedicine and 
several engagements around technology that minimizes human interaction while there is still great opportunity for growth. But I think that the most interesting thing also is the way that organizations are leveraging technology to create ease for life. So if you find organizations like big technology companies like Samsung and LG, they are able to deploy technology products, driven products, to the extent that you're so reliant on them. And with Internet of Things, your television, your washing machine, your microwave, your refrigerator are all interlinked. And with Internet of Things, you are able to have an easy life having to get connected with all of your appliances. So organizations are changing, individuals are changing, and we are all changing all over the world. Quite interesting, uh, a lot of change going on there. And, you know, looking at our financial, you know, uh, the landscape in, in Nigeria, you know, let's say, let's go back maybe five years now, compare, let's have a comparison, you know, with what we have, you know, today with all these uh, fintech startups, you know, coming up, how much of an improvement have we seen? significant improvement. The last one decade has been very remarkable, the way that the fintech companies has created and democratized banking and financial services. So when you look at the huge developments around e-wallets, where you can simply hold your cash and be able to do simple transactions like other a taxi with Uber, Taxify, food, anything that you want, they come to you because technology has created easier products that does not necessarily have to be big, huge banking solutions. And so you, besides e-wallet, it's also cash out, where you can make easy payments and receive payments. So wherever your money is, it's coming to you. And whoever you want to settle, you're also able to settle that. There are several other products that they have created that we have seen over the time that has made life easier. So lending, just think about micro lending. So SMEs and entrepreneurs are able to build their businesses through the very innovative way that fintech companies has created lending solutions. Just on the top of your phone, you're able to get more money to be able to invest in your business and to be able to create your uh, create more market. So you look at Carbon, you look at Sparkle, you look at Quick Cash. All of these organizations are creating solutions and products that means that no matter where you are, no matter what service you provide, you can lend, borrow from them, add to your business, do much more, expand your market and grow. And so all these are fostering economy. And of course, there is also the budget tools and for organizations and the financial management tools. I personally, as a management consultant, has extensively leveraged Bento Africa solution and product to be able to manage salaries, to be able to manage uh, staff loans to be able to manage tax, pension, and every single thing without even having to move out. And so all of these fintech companies, very innovative disruptors, like we know, are bringing all of this ease to life, yeah. to businesses, to organizations, and of course the economy at large. Yeah, but uh, talking about the lending uh, services, you know, we've had issues recently with, you know, some turning, turning into uh, loan sharks, mm -hmm. and we've seen... Uh, uh, consumer protection actually clamp down you know on some of these how, how can they you know make their services actually you know abide with the law you know at this point so and that's a very good one everywhere that are weak systems framework policies you would always have those so it is the time when supervisors and regulators of the financial service sector must begin to lead the game and the play around the fintech companies to be able to create frameworks and policies for stricter supervisions and regulation, collaborating with them to be able to consistently deliver the services, create more innovation by work within a framework. And I think FITC is doing so much around that, and I'll talk to you about that later. Quite interesting. But, you know, we've seen most of these fintechs emerge as, you know, unicorns, you know, leveraging technology with new, uh, you know, uh, designs for financial, you know, solutions. Quite interesting. We've seen a couple of them actually raise incredible amounts of mm -hmm. uh, funding. Yes. But how are you seeing, you know, a domestic investor participation in all of this? So domestic participation is very important. And I do know also that there are several angel investors today who are seeking these organizations, seeking these opportunities. So while the FDIs 
come with a lot of resources and big muscles. It's also important that we consistently keep those organizations within us. Otherwise, we are betting and growing organizations that would not really be Nigerian companies because the investors are international and foreign. So all of the people who've got the muscles, the resources around here must begin to look into the fintech as alternative resource platforms for investments. So if you look at all the companies and organizations quoted on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, this is the time to begin to realize that even the fintech companies also have the capability to absorb all of those resources. And then, of course, we have seen how they raise money and they become bigger than banks in terms of ranking and in terms of ratio. So if we can get all of those FDIs, I do know significantly so many Nigerians would be able to put much money so that we can bet our own indigenous companies and keep our resources, our assets, and our intellectual property in Nigeria. And so it'd be quite interesting to see, you know, some of these fintechs actually, you know, go public, mm -hmm. you know, at this point. How, how are you seeing that landscape? I do, I do believe that is the best way to go. Consistently, the FDI is bringing, I mean, foreign direct investment is coming in. They are all huge sums of money coming from people who are not, uh, a lot of them are not even African, so they're not from the continent. So the moment you begin to have those escapes, the moment we begin to lose greater opportunities. So yes, there is knowledge transfer. Yes, there is individual successes. But we really would like to see the fintech companies quoted on the exchange. And the resources are both in Nigeria and in Africa, and we should be able to do that. Quite interesting. And the World Bank stated that uh, goal is to achieve universal financial access you know, by uh, 2020 in Nigeria. The CBN has a clear target of reaching by 80% inclusion you know, by the end of the decade, you know, how are fintechs, you know, contributing to all of these goals? So we know how crucial that financial inclusion is. From the look of it and from the outside of the fintech, we are only seeing organizations that are creating innovation, creating solutions, creating products, leveraging technology. But when you break it down, we have fintech innovators and disruptors that are actually driving reach and penetration, and that's what financial inclusion is. So they are creating financial service products that can reach even the unbanked. So I read about an 80-year-old grandmother that was thinking about how she can get all of her assets from retirement. And ordinarily, having worked in Lagos for over 30 years and retired into somewhere in the Southwest, she was able to get her money on her app, on her phone. In the past, a decade ago, somebody would have said, come to Lagos, our head office is in Lagos. But she didn't have to do that all on her phone. And that's the way that penetration is beginning to happen, thanks to the fintech companies and the innovations that they are bringing. Now, besides the penetration is also the access to finance, which is what financial inclusion is about. Access to finance is critical because when people, today, for instance, we've got only about 48% of people who have bank accounts. And so the fintech innovative products are able to reach greater number of people even in the rural areas, wherever they are, so long as they've got a phone through mobile banking, through SMS banking. And the access that they get as a result of this means that no matter where you are, you would have access to education because you've got access to finance, access to better health care, access to business opportunities because then you can invest in any business that is around you. We've seen how there is even proliferation of agent banks almost in every rural place you go today. You are able to walk up to them and get money and do whatever you need to do locally. So you can imagine the businesses that are also able to incubate in those local resources as a result. When you think about this penetration and you think about this access that this uh, products are causing, then you can begin to think about the economic empowerment that is coming as a result of the fact that businesses can begin to grow. But most importantly is nation building. So if you look at all of this, the fintechs have driving penetration, driving access to finance, helping to catalyze economic growth, and that's nation building by virtue of economic stability and security. Right. And, you know, talking about that penetration, you know, we've seen uh, a telecom giant there, MTN, get the uh, license to actually operate as a payment, you know, service bank, you know, at this point, quite, quite a an interesting time, you know, in Nigeria where we can actually see, you know, mobile money penetration with this uh, happening. But how do you see this? 
I think it's a great play. And I'll tell you about the difference in another market. In Kenya, Telecom, Safaricom, and Pesa started the mobile banking approach. So 80% of the micro lending that is happening in Kenya is by Mpesa, which is owned by Safaricom, which is a telco. So you find that that is the other way for us. So the telcos are coming in late in this market, while in Kenya, they led the change. So today, that Mpesa product is unarguably the most successful financial service product in the whole of Africa. But the interesting thing is that even though the telcos are late entrants in Nigeria today, it's going to flip the game because they've got the numbers. In terms of reach, they are going to be riding on the existing infrastructure that they have, customer base that they have, subscription base that they have. But financial inclusion is financial inclusion. What I, whoever is leading it, it's not what is important. What is important is that we're meeting our national goals. We're meeting the CBN target set. We're also aligning to the global target set. Even uh, so, at the end of the day, the fintech, the telcos, with the size and might that they have, both in terms of resources, infrastructure, and subscriber base, would scale the vision for financial inclusion. And that's in the interest of both the economy and the nation and the world at large. So it's quite, a good quite, development. Quite interesting. And, you know, I've, I've seen some chatter, you know, on, on social media. They're talking about how this is actually a threat to fintechs and uh, banks. What do you think? Well, every business opportunity is a threat to someone. All everybody needs to do is to wake up, get up, become more innovative. First of all, it puts you on your toes. It brings quality and standardization. It also brings aggression in the marketplace and the fact in the sense, in the way that stimulates innovation, deeper thinking. So everybody has said the fintech are threats to banks. The banks are still there. The fintech are only developing new things that is democratizing banking and financial services reach. So when the telcos come, they would only add to what's happening already, and there will probably not be any big threat. They would only be adding value in the same way that others are. And the market is huge. So at a, for a nation where the banking population is at 48%, what do you think is going to happen to the rest of the 52 that are not banked? Let someone bank them. Right. Yeah? Quite interesting. Well, a competition is good for uh, consumers at this point. But, you know, what, what is... FITC, you know, doing to contribute to all of these uh, goals when it comes to financial inclusion and, you know, uh, financial literacy? Big time, doing big things. And I would start, first of all, with what we are doing with consumer literacy, operators literacy, knowledge for both operators and investors. So from time to time, we roll out very fantastic and innovative programs that bring knowledge about the financial service sector, products, services, um, with emphasis on fintech. And these knowledge programs, whether they are through our thought leadership programs like the conferences or the workshops or the summits or the executive education programs, bring a lot of learning around technology and innovation, market growth and business growth opportunities. So these are the ways that consumers learn much more about what's happening in that industry, and then operators know much more about new developments that can enhance their operations. But more importantly also is investors begin to understand much more about the industry. So you do not necessarily have to be a tech key to understand that there is an opportunity in investing in financial technology. So on June 29th and 30th, for instance, we're going to have another of our biggest fintech conference like we usually do every year, and that's the Technovate conference. And so these conferences have a minimum of like approximately 5,000 participants, over 50 speakers from all across the world, bringing resources inside local and international to the game. Another way, very interestingly, that SFITC is leading the game in knowledge sharing and extending knowledge across the sector and industries for efficient play is what we do with regulators. So we asked already about how we can consistently make the fintech companies remain strong, well regulated and you know, standardized. So we bring a lot of knowledge to fintech, uh, to the financial services regulators and when we do this, we create like risk-based supervision for fintech, specifically designed for regulators, so that they can understand the fintech space, the opportunities, the risk 
inherent and the way that they can formulate policies and framework to create the quality and standard that is required. Quite a, quite a lot, uh, FITC. Is There's another one. Right there. And very lastly, yeah. we do not end at this tool. We also look to grow knowledge. So right now, we've got a network of over 10,000 youths in across the whole of Africa under our program Youth Connect. Under Youth Connect, we are specifically focused on creating capacity and skills around technology and innovation for young people who invariably, in the end, at the end of the day, are assumed within the financial service sector Quite as professionals. Quite interesting. Well, we have so many, <laughs> a huge population of the youth, and this is actually a good one. It would be interesting to see how uh, this uh, sector plays out in the next uh, decade. Thank you so much. Uh, Chizo Melize, MD, FITC, for coming on the program. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to come back. Thank you. All right, so uh, after the break, uh, Apex Commodities Market Update is next. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. All right, now time to drill down on the Apex uh, Commodities Exchange. Well, it's uh, mostly green on the uh, commodity market summary for the week ended 11th of April 2022. Most of the parameters closed in the green except the Apex Commodity Index. I was down about 0.69%. Well, we have a Michael Martin now, portfolio manager at Apex. He has the details. Great to have you, Michael. Good morning. Hi, Ladi. Good morning. Um, Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Always great to have you. Well, uh, give us a rundown on uh, market activities for the week. Um, thank you very much, Ladi. Um, so if you look at the table in front of you, it gives um, the commodities market summary. Um, the total, uh, trans total turnover of transactions that happened on the exchange in the week under consideration um, you know, went up by a factor of 13.45 um, from 0.72 billion to close to trading week at 9.63 billion. Uh, the total number of contracts traded on the exchange also went up by, 16 point, by a factor of 16.34 from 2.14 million contracts to close to trading week at 34, uh, more than 34 million contracts. The number of deals also went up by 58.12% from 308 last week to close to trading week at 487 deals. Uh, we, however, saw a slight decline in the Apex Commodities Index, which is the ACI, which fell slightly by 0.69% from 488.68 points to close to trading week at 485.32 points. We also saw a slight increase in the Apex Export Index, which is the AEI, which went up by 0.52% from 204.58 points to close to trading week at 205.65 points. Uh, with regards to the volume of contracts traded on the exchange, there was a general increase, particularly with Maze, which went up from now down 50,000 contracts um, to trade over 31 million contracts in the week under consideration. Um, soybean also went up from 1.17 million contracts to trade over 2.4 million contracts this week. Um, rice also went up significantly from 471 contracts to trading over 131,000 contracts uh, this week. Um, so those are largely most of the volume changes on the exchange. Uh, with regards to price, um, there was a general increase uh, with cashew, which went up by 4.60%. To close to trading week at 628 NAB and uh, 27 COBO. Um, cocoa also went up by 3.13% to close to trading week at 1,259 NAB, 27 COBO. Um, Sogum, however, fell significantly by 7.86% to close to trading week at 208 uh, NAB, 24 COBO. Paddy rice also fell by 6.38% to close to trading week at 236 NAB, 43 COBO. Uh, maize also fell by 2.82% um, to close to trading week at 233 uh, NAB, 55 COBO. Um, soybean also fell by 1.97% to close to trading week at 395 NAB, 85 uh, COBO. So those are largely most of the price, volume, and also commodity market um, changes in the commodities market that we saw on the exchange in the week under consideration. And as we always mention, if you want to know more about the commodities market, you can always go to our website, which is www apexnigeria.com or you can also download our app which is available on ios and also on android all right michael thanks for the uh rundown well let's uh, take the conversation further now we know uh, rising food prices are ringing you know alarm bells for households uh, all over the world we've seen the uk inflation hit a 30-year high us about 40-year high 
mm -hmm. everywhere inflation is rising. And, you know, we've had that debate, you know, about that sweet hedge, you know, for inflation. A lot of uh, <laughs> analysts have given different asset classes, you know, that can actually hedge. But let's look at commodity trading. C can it actually hedge against inflation? Um, yeah, thanks a lot for that question. I think it's very important considering the context you just met, you just you know you've just mentioned um, UK at a 40-year inflation high, the US also at a three-decade inflation high. Um, so one of the things we've measured, um, you know, at the commodities exchange is to measure the level of correlation, you know, between the commodities market and also inflation. Um, so one of the things we found out when we measured the level of correlation between the ACI, which is the commodities index, and then also, um, you know, the CPI, which is the measure of inflation in the country, you would tend to see about a 60 to 70 percent correlation between those two, um, between those two data points. And that tells you that, you know, if you see a large price movement in one, um, you would also tend to see, you know, uh, the same type of price movement in the other. That tells you that there is a very strong relationship between both, um, you know, data points. I think it's also important to know that the CPI is usually um, a lagging indicator of what has already happened in the commodities market because in the computation of the CPI itself, um, you know, you have the raw materials, which are the commodities, or, you know, that we have a focus on the exchange. And even if it's not the raw materials, you have the finished products that have been measured or the price changes in the finished products you know, that have been measured you know on a monthly basis in our on a monthly basis in our case uh, why they tend to say that you know the commodities market is the edge, or investing in the commodities market is the edge against inflation is that you don't tend to see that level of correlation um, you know with other asset classes right so take for example um, in, in the equities market they tend to do well when inflation you know when the inflation numbers are stable um, you know, fixed income market also does well, particularly with yields when inflation, you know, is high. And, you know, the government is trying to correct that by raising interest rates. And the reason why they say significantly that the commodities market is also an edge against inflation is because of return on investment, right? So the question is, if I invest in this asset class, will I get a return that is higher than inflation? And because of that level of correlation between the commodities market and also the inflation rate, um, you tend to see that the return on investment in the commodities market, um, you know, would tend to beat what the inflation rate is in that particular economy. Quite interesting. And, you know, we're seeing you know, equity markets get rattled, you know, at this time. But, you know, what are the notable signals or drivers, you know, potential investors you should actually be paying attention to before uh, getting to, into commodity trading? Um, thanks a lot for that question. So I, I think the first thing is to note that, um, you know, there are different dynamics that play out within the commodities market um, that is that is significantly different from, you know, the different types of asset classes that you have, you know, whether that's fixed income or whether or not that's also you know, equity. So first off is that commodities market is cyclical. Um, and you have to take, because it's cyclical, you also have to take into account, you know, the supply and demand dynamics, which tends to feed into the final closing price of that particular commodity. So that's the largest, you know, indicator and driver that anybody investing in the commodities market should take note of. Um, another issue which is also, which, which has also become important in recent weeks is also, you know, government policy and, you know, more importantly, you know, geopolitics. I, I think we've spoken at length with regards to how, you know, the situation in Russia and Ukraine, you know, has affected the price prices of certain commodities like wheat, um, you know, and also oil too. I think aside from that, aside from the supply and demand dynamics, aside from geo government politics and, and uh, government policy and geopolitics, you also need to pay attention to the macroeconomic factors like you know interest rates, exchange rates, and then also as you, as you've already mentioned, the inflation rates. So those are usually the macroeconomics that tend to affect, um, you know, the commodities market at any given at any given point in time. Um, and of course, you also want to pay attention to uh, uh, you know this, the the seasonality of the commodity that you're investing in. Um, so when you put all those factors together, those are mo most of the major drivers that you should be paying attention to, um, you know, if you're planning on investing in the commodities market. Yeah, not, not an easy time to be an investor, Michael. But, you know, talking about <laughs> risk, you know, right now is all about, you know, the risk mm -hmm. of, you know, trading. There, there are also risk, you know, with uh, agricultural commodities. But what are the products available on the exchange exactly. that, you know, address, you know, different risk appetite for investors? Um, you know, thanks a lot for that question. I think, you know, for you as an investor, the first thing you need to figure out, you know, as you've mentioned, is your risk appetite, right? Um, so are you a, you know, risk-averse investor or are you a risk-loving investor? 
Um, currently on the exchange, we have um, you know different products that are available depending on what your risk appetite is. So I will just go through um, you know uh, about three of them. So first off, we have the spot contracts, which tends to mirror you know what exactly a stock does, right? So, so much in the same way a stock gives you a right of ownership to a company, um, a spot contracts give you a right of ownership to a particular commodity at an Apex accredited warehouse. And what you would tend to see is that 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 you know the price dynamic on a spot contract would tend to mimic what the price of that, what that physical commodity is also doing in the local commodities market. Um, you know, correlation can be as, as high as between 96% to, you know, uh, uh, 100%. Uh, and this tends to be a medium to a low risk product, uh, but it's also a high risk, uh, I mean, high return product, um, I should say. So you tend to see the return on this type of product range between about 30, you know, to about 40%, depending on the, depending on the commodity that you're invested in. Um, secondly, is also the exchange traded commodity, which is the ETF. Uh, which is the ETC um, anyways, which is like a basket of different spot contracts that you can essentially buy and hold, um, you know, over a 270-day period that would essentially give you uh, exposure to the commodities market. So in addition to being able to buy individual, you know, spot contracts, you can buy, you, as opposed to buying just individual spot contract, you can essentially buy an entire basket. And that basket gives you exposure to the, you know, to different commodities at the same time. Um, so this particular product did about 68% last year, over a 200 70-day period. Um, this year, the FETC, which, which is what we call it, um, you know, has done more than 20% for both the FETC1 and FETC2. And this tends, the return on this investment tends to range, you know, conservatively between 20 to 30% at any given period of time. Uh, and it's a medium to a low risk, uh, it's a medium to a low risk uh, financial product. Lastly, but certainly not least, is, uh, you know, fixed income products that you have on the exchange in terms of the asset back commercial paper, or you have, you know, the impute note, or you also have the trade finance note. Um, so these are essentially designed much in the same way fixed income products are designed with a guaranteed, um, you know, uh, investment return over a fixed period of time. And the, and the return on this type of investment tends to range between 10 to 15 percent, depending on the um, depending on the investment, depending on the particular investment product itself. Um, so those are broadly the three different types of products that are currently available on the exchange. You know, depending on what your risk appetite is as an investor. Um, soon to be also soon to also be part of the conversation is derivative product, which is another way for different participants, um, you know, to edge their um, you, to edge and protect against you know risk in the commodities market. And I should also say, you know, here that when you're investing in a fixed income product, you have a guaranteed you know rate of return which is not something that you essentially have with all the two different types of products like the spot contracts and also the exchange-traded um, exchange contracts. Quite, quite a number of products there, uh, Michael, and you know, you know how I like my returns. Thank you so much, Michael. Always great to talk to you. Yeah, always welcome, Lottie. All right, now we'll take a moment. All right, now talking about markets, let's uh, drill down on the equities uh, market. Will, back right. to 47K. <laughs> yes, laddie, good morning. Um, you Hope you don't about take returns. profit this time. Hope you yeah, don't take talking profit. talking about returns, the equities market has made a big return back to the 47,000 level, as you mentioned. It has extended Monday's positive trading, and this followed uh, sustained interest in MTN Nigeria, which is up about 1.3%. We saw a fly in Zenit Bank, 5.8%, and also SEPLA added about 25 naira to its share price yesterday. The all-share index edged up 0.72%. That's quite phenomenal to that level we're seeing right now. We hope that that point is sustained throughout the week. Month to date and year to date gains have also increased 0.5% and 10.5% respectively. Now, total volume of trades increased by 9.3% to 245.42 million units. It was valued at 4.59 billion naira and all transacted in 5,834 deals. Now we have Ambrose Amodion, he is the Chief Research Officer at Investdata Consultant Limited to tell us what is going down in the market. Good morning, Ambrose. Yeah, good morning. Now we're back in the 47,000 level. Run us through quickly what is currently driving market sentiments. Yeah, actually I will tell you that the auditor um, result for 2021 was impressive. And I said it earlier on different programs that when results hit the market, the big boys who do the PFPs, they don't just jump into buying. They take time to analyze these results before they start taking position. 
As we speak now, they've done their diligence on this number and they see potential and many of the stocks in the exchange are undervalued. They are now back to the market to take position ahead of P1 number. Knowing that we expect that the P1 number was to take the trend of what we saw in uh, 2021. Knowing that the, the new the new post push inflation was seen way impact much on the first quarter number, or less on the second quarter we expect at the end of uh, June. For me, we are seeing a positive sentiment because we are seeing that most of the exchange and the value, like the attraction on the market now, and also despite that there was a little you know, uptick in the you know, physical market, we saw that you know, that investors are not taking position more on equity to edge against what inflation. I'm looking forward to see the inflation figure on Friday. Now, can this positive sentiment, while we wait for inflation numbers to come out, can this positive sentiment be sustained you know, with inflation expected expectations this week? Yeah, you know, as uh, you know, big uh, players who call them smart money for you to reposition their postulate between now and the end of this month of April, we expect the sentiment to be in the market. But don't forget that, that profit taking is as a part of the market anytime. Now we have seen a three days uh, rally in the market. I expect that profit taking will come. That's why we expect a miss trend between now and the end of the month. But for me, it will be a good, ma a good market for us. Market has crossed back again, or index has crossed back again the 47,000 mark, who shows that there's strength in the market, and this strength is supported by what? By positive sentiment. For me, to sustain both the end of this week, but let's say before next week, before I say much, much number comment, like today now, we saw that um, you know, United Capital released the approval number. That's a given insight what to expect because the number was, you know, was so fantastic that it beat uh, analysts and investors' uh, expectation. If that trend is maintained in most of the first quarter uh, results we're expecting, this sentiment might likely last till end of uh, uh, March. Uh, end so of uh, um, if it's not. You're talking about the numbers already, the earnings season, which is right around the corner. Can you break down some of the important stock numbers ahead of this um, uh, quarter, this uh, period we're coming into? You know, in, a, in equity investment, you don't wait to see the number before you take decision. And those that have done their due diligence that have, you know, understand the market have position before now. And now the numbers are hitting the market, so that if the numbers are positive, you know, put the price up. That's why you make money in equity trading. But as I said earlier, we expect that this uh, Q1 number will be better than what we saw the previous year because even the, the high cost of production that, you know, that really hit the market around the uh, uh, late uh, March won't affect the, the first quarter results much. But here in this uh, second quarter, my see the impact. But don't forget that if uh, also the companies are able to push this uh, cost to the consumer, that means we're going to see even better number in future. It depends on the service and the product that uh, that is that, that, you know, in, um, you know, in focus. But I believe that that investors should not panic. Despite what is happening in the, in the global trend, let's focus our market because we are seeing that we are seeing more funds enter the market as reviewed by our money flow index analysts that funds is coming back to the equity market, which is good to support the trend. But don't forget that as an investor, you don't wait to see the number before you invest. You invest before the number in the market. And also, if you want to look at the numbers that are very, very outstanding, look at their top line, it must be above 15% you know, and above for you to say this is a strong number. And also, if you want to see the bottom line, it must be also above 15%. You see, you know, it's a good number. And also, your EPS will be in that direction. Your margin, uh, profit margin, will be also above 10% to see that this stock is also for uh, company result is good. And like what we saw in Yoka that just came this morning, they, they put their top line with them um, almost at 35%, and their bottom line with them um, with 39.16%. It's massive this for Yoka, and they're earning per share for first quarter to that, uh, no, 0 .3, it, uh, you know, 0.38. No, per share for me is a good one for. Recap. That's the that UCAP that shows that this is a well managed company that investors should look way of UCAP. Okay, so just moving quickly to the fixing gun space, we are going to have the NTB auction, that's the Treasury auction today, it's expected today. Do you think investors should start panicking? Probably they're going to be moving you know, funds to the fixing gun space and probably shaking the equities markets. Do you think that's going to happen? No, no, I don't see that happening because we are seeing a positive trend, but profit taking might come up, but not because of the fixing gun. Because yesterday, the market came almost at 0 0.72. They know that it ahead today is what the first income option, um, PCB option, market still remains strong. You can see that the stock that are even in the market, um, you know, these are blue chip stocks that are moving the market. You can see the life of MTN, Stepflat, and all Zenith Bank. These are stocks that have value. And it's better that there's opportunity for them to make more money if they can stay put on time and before we start seeing the, the heat of uh, the, 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 the election of political party.
Thank you so much, Amrose Somodion, Chief Research Officer at Investdata Consulting Limited. Thank you for coming on the program. Now, quickly to the fixed income market. We saw the bond space was a bit quiet yesterday, but we saw slightly bearish sentiments with investors. They continue to cherry pick high yielding uh, maturities there. Average yield rose marginally by one point, uh, one basis point for the 2026 maturity. That's 2026 paper closing at 11.15 percent on the bid. Treasury bills market was pretty much not not activity there, pocket of demand, but it was not really very active. And it closed unchanged yesterday, almost segment is pretty much the same. We're expecting the Treasury bills um, auction to take place today, and we're going to see how yields, you know, probably is going to trend upward or trend lower. No, today will tell at the end of the day. So, Ladi, that's what we have today. Quite interesting. We see uh, Amadian saying the big boys are taking position, mm -hmm. you know, in the equity space at this time. That's so why we're seeing that. <laughs> Uh, buying pressure, pressure you, you know, know, coming into the market. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> All right, Will, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, we'll take a quick break. Now when we come back, we head to London. That's in a moment. Stay with us. All right, now let's uh, head to the UK. We have Juliana uh, right there. Good morning, Juliana. Great to have you. Well, it's a 30-year high. It was expected. How is it, uh, this uh, data being digested right there in the UK? Yeah, um, it's it's not great, uh, Laddie. Uh, good morning. Another uh, a month, another record high uh, set of inflation data. Inflation is coming um, this morning at 7%. This is much higher than, of course, uh, what the Bank of England expected and much higher than the 2% uh, benchmark. In fact, I was reading on Twitter, uh, somebody said it's 7%, but it actually feels uh, more like uh, 15%. You're definitely feeling uh, the pinch. Uh, this uh, data relates to March, which is last month. So this was when we were full within uh, the war um, of um, uh, Ukraine uh, by uh, Russia. We know that oil prices spiked uh, to record highs. And that's really been uh, reflected in the data released by the Office for National Statistics this morning. Uh, petrol uh, prices um, are really pushing the upward trend. Um, they're up 9% on the month. Also, footwear, clothing, they're also um, higher. Services, we know that Britain is a service-based economy. So if you're somebody in the past few weeks that's been out um, staying at a hotel, eating at a restaurant, buying coffee, you really would have felt um, the, the increase in prices. And that has been reflected in this data. Now, the attention is squarely uh, focused on Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England and the Monetary Policy Committee. They will be gathering in a couple of weeks at Threadneedle Street to decide interest rates, which have um, uh, three times consecutively been increased, currently at 0.755%. All odds are on now that it will be increased to about 1% to try and curb uh, the surge in prices, which we don't think has peaked just yet. Right. Most central bankers are uh, looking quite hawkish, you know, uh, at this point. But uh, I see Piano Fair is, is uh, back in the news again. Uh, they were supposed to resume cross-channel services, but their, their ship is still being detained right now. Yeah, that's right. Um, P&O, the embattled uh, cruise uh, uh, company, um, is uh, currently under a, a, a really uh, severe probe by the British government. And this all goes back to last month when, um, without notice, they sacked all of their entire 800 staff. This really um, angered the British government, also angered uh, the public, which is why a serious probe is, is currently underway. Uh, what the government are doing, ahead uh, leaded by by um, uh, the Transport Minister Grant Schatz is to have a look at all of their vessels to make sure they are fit uh, for the sea and fit uh, for the new seafarers, the much cheaper seafarers that they have working aboard. Two vessels had already been detained, and now another third vessel has been detained. And it's because of uh, the detention of this vessel that they will not be able to uh, resume uh, with regular uh, crossings um, this Easter bank holiday weekend. They was hoping that they'd be able to do that, but the government are really putting their thumb on them, uh, trying to, uh, to make them reverse their decision and reinstate all of the 800 staff, which P&O Ferry said they will not be doing. So the, the, the battle... Uh, between Grant Shapps and Peter Hebblethwaite, uh, the CEO of the firm, continues. I guess the battle uh, rages on right there. Thank you so much, Juliana. We'll uh, get an update from you uh, later at 1.30. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
All right, now let's uh, take a look at the uh, crypto market that we see. Uh, the market cap that's uh, sitting at $1.87 trillion. It's uh, lost that $2 trillion mark, but trying to get back above it at this point. It's up by 1.18%. We see the uh, volume traded, $90.90 billion. That's down about 12.93%. That's talking about uh, the uh, altcoins and the uh, Bitcoin. Uh, we see Bit Bitcoin dominance, 40.72%. Uh, Price of Bitcoin this morning, at ATM, about $39,985. It's uh, down about, it's up about 0.14%. We see an upside uh, corruption trying to happen there at, uh, up, up above the 40,000 level. We see Bitcoin try to climb above the 40,400 40, level, but uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, bearish sell-offs when it tries to get above uh, that level. And we see Ethereum there sitting at $3,048. Trying to hold on to that uh, $3,000 support. All right, let's bring in Solomon Amunde now, digital market analyst. Hello, Solomon. Good morning. Good morning, Ladi. Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you uh, on the program today, visually, not just your voice this time. Well, uh, yeah. let's uh, yeah. look at some issues then. I will see uh, Chris Dixon turned about $350 million to $6 billion in 2021, a 17x gain, you know, for... Uh, a VC there. Do you think it would be possible for VCs to make such gains in a short time going forward in the crypto market? Yeah, actually, it would be way more difficult this time around because um, we no longer are in the bullish market. And also now, like, so many persons are involved. We have so many players involved. And that, that opportunity to be able to get projects at a very, very undervalued price wouldn't be there. Unlike um, 2018, 2019, 2020, we had the likes of Uniswap that were extremely undervalued, which was actually one of such projects that they invested in and made such huge returns. This time around, it will be quite difficult to get such projects. So it will be possible for them to make it in the long run, but short term, it won't be that easy. Quite. Well, the market is looking quite difficult, you know, at this point. But do you think, you know, too much, you know, venture capital investment in crypto and uh, blockchain projects would affect, you know, the decentralized nature of crypto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Def definitely, I've been looking at that for a while. We we have so much venture capitalists coming in and trains, training lots of funds and crypto projects these days. And when you look at how they are being rewarded, they are being rewarded with the tokens. And we all know what the tokens stand for when it comes to a decentralized project. It's majorly for voting and taking decisions on projects and features that should be launched in such projects. So you can imagine when the VCs hold a huge chunk of this project, thus they'll be the one controlling most of the down decisions. So I feel long term, VCs investing so much in cryptocurrency it will definitely affect the decentralized nature. Quite interesting. Well, we're seeing uh, Bitcoin that uh, trying to get above the 40K level. It was trading around 39,000. Uh, How do you see uh, Bitcoin uh, price action uh, this morning? Yeah. It, we, we, we are still having that strong upward momentum, basically, because um, we've had that $9,000 support very, very well, like very, very well. And that, that was one of the most important supports. So right now, we should expect Bitcoin to try and be test for $4,000 and also range between $9,000 and $4,000. Failure to go above $4,000, we might just see us going below that $9,000. But hopefully, the market is looking pretty green this week, and we're expecting us to hold that $9,000, basically. Quite interesting. And we're seeing uh, uh, the NAS tech heavy NASDAQ also uh, getting sell-offs uh, yesterday, and we're seeing that correlation between uh, NASDAQ and Bitcoin. All right, Solomon, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for coming on the program. All right, thanks very much. All right, now let's look at the top polls market cap. We see uh, BNB that's uh, mostly green this morning. We see BNB up about 3.16%. We see Cardano at 95 cents. That's up 1.42%. Uh, now we see Solana there uh, trying to crawl back uh, up there above the $100 mark, it's uh, up by 1.55%. We see XRP, 71 cents, quite stable there, uh, up about 1.50%. All right, that's it uh, on the crypto market. And uh, that's a wrap on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to join us at 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.